Thank you very much, everybody. Um, yeah, I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, so I'm Henry Gray. I'm the incident manager for uh, WHO's uh, cholera response team. Um, we've been set up uh, to, to help the cholera program uh, with the current upsurge in, uh, in um, cholera outbreaks that we see across the world. Uh, a little secret, I'm actually a wash engineer. So I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm more interested in GTFCC than I am in emergency response, but for some, some, some reason I've been dragged into emergency response for years. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in what the GTFCC has to offer and, and how it's going to be able to help uh, remove you know, the, 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 the problem of cholera that we're seeing across, uh, across much of the world. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, a, a a brief um, epi situation update and, and uh, context analysis, a little bit where we are uh, in, uh, in the state of play. As was just mentioned, um, we've got more cases of cholera in more countries, and we've got new countries now reporting cholera. Uh, so the likes of, uh, of Lebanon, uh, uh, Syria, um, Iswatini recently, um, we've got cholera in places that we weren't expecting to see it again. Uh, we've still got our cholera in uh, in our, our more traditional um, countries, but uh, we've seen this global uh, global um, uh, increase in uh, in in the, the spread. Um, let's see. There we go. Right. So this is just a, a a huge health warning on this. So. Pulling data together for cholera is virtually impossible. Okay, we've got an awful lot of people uh, who are currently trying to make sense of all the data that's coming across from uh, across the world, but we are not comparing apples with apples. Uh, it's uh, it's 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 very difficult to uh, to really uh, to get a, a clear picture of what's going on because of the differences in uh, data quality, uh, reporting times, um, case definitions. Uh, and was also just mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the openness to share data for, uh, for, for some countries. So this is just looking back to the uh, start of the millennia. Um, a few things that you will um, recognize, um, the peaks associated with Haiti uh, in yellow, 2010-11. Uh, and then we've got the, um, uh, the peak in, in, the, in the bright blue uh, associated with Yemen. Uh, so a million cases plus, probably not all cholera, I think is fair to say. Uh, so again, that, that highlights some of the issues we've got. If we then look at the last couple of years, the last few years, uh, we've got uh, 2021, where we had a big outbreak in, uh, in Nigeria, which really drove the, the high case fatality ratio uh, you'll see on the dotted line. And then we've got 2022, uh, 2023, with uh, Asia picking up a lot more cases than um, was, was perhaps uh, expected, um, but with outbreaks of AWD in uh, Afghanistan, in Pakistan, um, and uh, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Syria. Uh, so you know, really more, more cases being reported out of Asia, but probably still a big under, uh, under-reporting. Uh, so we're still not getting the numbers from the likes of uh, India, for, for example. Uh, Bangladesh, we, we, get, we get information, but, but sometimes it's not the whole picture. So we, we really do have this as a, a rider in terms of caveat on the, on the data. What we're worried about is the 2022-23 um, numbers. Uh, these are still provisional because the, the data hasn't all been uh, fully rinsed and cleaned as much as possible. But we're not seeing a, a positive uh, uh, trend in terms of, of Africa um, uh, and, and also um, back to Haiti, uh, the, the outbreak that's really taking off, uh, oh, has, has taken off uh, in Haiti over the last 12 months. Uh, 2023 is the data from this year. So we're halfway through the year and yet we're also... Um, looking at uh, big numbers. To try and make this slightly less controversial, um, we've picked a few different um, measures. So what we're looking at here is the number of, um, uh, of, of countries with more than 10,000 cases. Could we see if we could move the... Yeah. Um, so number of countries with 10,000 or more cases of cholera per year. And as you can see, 2022 uh, is uh, the, the highest in, in the past 20, 23 years. But we're six months through 2023. We're already at eight. Uh, and we, we can be pretty, pretty sure 
that we'll be we'll be looking at uh, uh, at, at least uh, matching 2022 and probably um, probably um, surpassing it. We're also looking at the number of countries with more than 50 cases um, with a CFR greater than um, than one percent. So you can see the improvement um, over over the years, but then this year already matching last year uh, in terms of uh, a, a deterioration in case fatality ratio uh, for, for, um, for, for outbreaks. So, um, let's, why are we not moving? There we go. So, current operational cholera context. Uh, so we've already mentioned uh, from 2022 and the, the first couple of months of this year, high CFR. Um, we've talked about climate change and we need to continue talking about it. Three La Ninas uh, in, in consecutive, uh, consecutive years, not, not seen before. Um, and the subsequent flooding, cyclones, droughts that have put pressure uh, uh, across, across the globe. Um, a change in the uh, the OCV strategy due to uh, supply issues uh, in 2022, uh, and and that inability for us to to carry out preventive campaigns in uh, in hotspots, and then also uh, just a, a real problem with uh, the production of cholera supplies. People were ordering so many kits um, that the the supply chain basically froze. We we weren't able to 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 get cholera kits together and out the door quick enough. And uh, that, that's a, a problem that's still going on. And then uh, a, a familiar refrain, um, a lack of financial resources uh, for, uh, for the, 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 all of last year and the start of this year. And we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that uh, later. Um, 2023, again, basically the same, same as last year. Um, so high CFR, um, most, uh, Malawi at, at one point was, was almost in double digits. And that, that's come right down now with, um, uh, with good leadership from ministry and partners uh, to improve uh, access to um, ORPs, for instance, uh, but still uh, high, high CFR across uh, many countries. Some countries still with big outbreaks and, and low CFRs, but, but um, higher CFRs are the norm. Um, so we also have our um, uh, you know, climate, climate related issues, cyclones, droughts and flooding. Um, El Nino, we're bouncing straight from uh, La Nina into El Nino uh, with no neutral phase, which again is going to give us uh, headaches um, later this year, start of next year. And we've also got our traditional seasonal pattern um, of uh, uh, cholera peaks for, um, for, for Asia, uh, Central Asia, West Africa. Um, we're now worried about Ukraine and also uh, the uh, Caribbean still have issues um, on uh, OCV um, availability, which I think Philippe will touch upon later. Uh, and we've still got a production um, uh, of cholera kits issue. Uh, and some kits are taking between three and six months uh, to, from order time of order to, to time of dispatch. And then this huge lack of, um, uh, this huge gap in the financial resources for outbreak response, let alone the kind of the, 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 the big piece of work that, that GTFCC is driving. So, we're having clicker issues. Ah, here we go. So, on the basis of uh, this expanded geographical um, uh, the spread, basically, uh, the the issues that we've got in terms of supply chain um, and also as uh, OCV, uh, various things. We WHO has, uh, with its internal grading uh, risk grading system, has basically uh, graded cholera um, as um, a, a global risk as, as very high, um, with our moderate confidence in the available um, data, uh, sorry, the information, but based on this, the, these issues with data that, that, that we, we're all kind of aware of. So what, what's WHO going to do about that? Um, talk with partners, first of all, work with partners. Um, but internally, um, we are, we've basically stood up um, our incident management sy system Again, that's based on our risk analysis. Um, we've, we've assessed risk for cholera um, back in October 2022, again in January, um, and uh, we've re revised this um, uh, last month. 
uh, still as an overall risk as, as very high. Uh, and that basically puts into play uh, a few extra tools for WHO to help um, uh, with the, the response to cholera. So we've, we have a, a headquarters-based um, incident management uh, team, um, and we're basically there to try and support the regions and the countries with their response at, at that, more, that more granular level. Uh, what it does do is it allows us to bring a lot of people uh, to, to bear on a problem that you wouldn't get if it was just being managed at a country level uh, or, or even at a regional level. And the whole point of this IMST, uh, this, this setup, is so that the lines of communication between HQ, the regions, uh, and, the, uh, and the country office is improved. Not just within WHO, but also outside WHO as well. It's still something we need to work on, but it is definitely improving. So the HQ IMST looks a bit like this. Um, it's, it's, when, when you look at the size of Philippe's team, uh, it's, it's probably th three or four times the number of boxes it's not all individual people, but it's the functions that are associated with the uh, HQIMST, and it sits very much alongside the cholera team. So Philippe is basically my, my counterpart. Uh, we talk several times a day, um, and then we've got people from his team embedded in the, uh, the different pillars within the IMST. This is then reflected um, at, uh, at a regional level to, to one extent or another. So the Western Pacific region for WHO has the Philippines, so they don't have this big setup. They've got a small team looking at it. But when you look at the African region and the um, uh, Eastern Mediterranean region, they have similar setup, but without the, without the, the, the number of people, basically. Really good news for WHO is that we also started to be able to embed people from other agencies within this within this setup. It improves the communication no end. So we've got, I think, three or four of our colleagues from UNICEF here today. Uh, I have a counterpart in, uh, in UNICEF. And again, we're, we're talking every day, trying to improve the links between WHO and, and UNICEF in particular, but also through things like logistics, um, we've got, we're in touch with uh, MSF, with um, the, 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 Red, uh, the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, Lots of different people, especially for the, these areas where we've got, we've got issues. Right. So, um, key IMST activities. What, one of the biggest things um, that we are able to do is to pull, pull people from different parts of, of our house, but also the houses of others. Uh, and we're, we are basically doing a lot more on the epidemiological uh, uh, data collection, analysis, and products. As some of you may have seen now, there's a global sit rep that comes out monthly. Um, we've got different, it, it's a huge amount of work requiring a lot of people, um, which the cholera team in its current incarnation is not able to support. And so while the IMST exists, we, we hope to be delivering a lot more in terms of this information that allows partners to, to make informed decisions um, uh, and help them focus on, on their, their, their priorities. Um, so we, we're also working uh, with colleagues within uh, WHO, uh, within uh, members of the GTFCC to try and, and develop um, and update uh, existing tools um, for better case management, for instance. But, but other, uh, we're looking at IPC. Uh, and again, we, we, we have a, a kind of momentum within, uh, within the WHO IMST that allows us to, to do some heavy lifting that we can then bring to the likes of the, of the, the GTFCC for, for blessing. We are able to uh, surge people. Uh, lots of people get to, to go to the field. We're, we're able to, to, to ring directors directly and, and ask them, can, we, need, we need your staff. Can you send people? And we've, we've had a uh, you know, really good um, number of deployments through, um, uh, particularly to um, Mozambique and Malawi this year, uh, sending some of, our, some of the brains uh, that we've got in the organization to go out and help country offices at, uh, at, that, um, uh, at that, that crucial you know, most important uh, place the, where we've actually got the outbreaks. We've developed a, a, a strategic preparedness, readiness and response plan. It's quite a mouthful. Uh, we'll have a look about, at that in a moment, um, which is, again, larger than WHO. Uh, it's, uh, it's for health partners, so basically trying to drum up awareness and money. We've done that alongside um, UNICEF with their call to action. We'll, we'll give you some numbers in a moment. But again, we're trying to uh, get resources, but also awareness of the, of the cholera uh, situation as we see it at the moment. Um, 
so we are yeah we are um we're we're really pushing this this um joined up approach with uh, with other agencies uh, and, and particularly unicef uh to to help uh move things along quicker but in a more effective uh, effective way reducing overlap and the final thing for for which we are really useful for is that the imst generally has better access to emergency funding so our contingency fund for emergencies, the CFE, uh, has been able to, to stump up money for emergency response where, we, where appeals for money have gone uh, unanswered. We, we are able to, to, to shift money uh, rapidly to countries. There we go. Just an example, not going to go into the detail, but basically... Uh, the Horn, uh, the Horn of Africa, Mandera Triangle between Somalia, Ethiopia and Kenya, three different country offices, two WHO regions, two or three uh, other incident management teams working in those countries for the um, uh, food insecurity, for uh, humanitarian crisis. Uh, we're basically there to help pull all this stuff together to make sure that people are, are, are getting access to cholera information, um, that we are able to uh, coordinate things like ICG requests together, um, just to basically build this uh, more coherent approach to, um, uh, to, a, to, a, to a disease that does not respect borders. You know, the, the, we, we, the, this makes sense to us. Uh, instead of having three country offices trying to tackle it, let's get, let's get a coordinated approach uh, and, and it is paying dividends. Money has just been released to these three countries. Uh, ICG, ICG requests are ongoing. Vaccination, I think, is ongoing. And again, we, whilst we are, we're not doing the work, we're behind the scenes trying to move things and put a bit of oil in the motor, get things moving. Um, so this is basically, the, we, WHO has got a new system for uh, health emergencies, preparedness, response, and, and resilience. And it's really how we're trying to fit cholera response into the, into the HEPA. Uh, so the, the pillars are things you will recognize in, probably in your sleep. You can list them. Uh, all the, all the, the good things that are found in the, uh, the GTFCC guidelines um, uh, about how we, how we actually approach the cholera response. Uh, but then how that is then mapped into these five core areas um, that are, are, are to be due to be the kind of the framework for WHO's emergencies going forward. So for, for WHO, we're looking at an ask of $160 million for 12 months for around 40 countries. That's response only. It's not I mean, there will be a, some money that is transferable, some capacity building for laboratories and the like. But this is basically for life-saving activities to be, do, to, to be delivered through ministries by partners uh, at, at field level. Asi uh, alongside that, the UNICEF call to action, $480 million, which is the, the, the normal proportion when we look at WHO UNICEF um, uh, ratios for, for spending money on cholera outbreaks. But you know, we're, we're over, over $600 million just for 12 months. And basically, we'll be coming back in 12 months' time and asking for more if we're, if we're, because it, it, the situation is not getting any better. So, uh, final slide. Um, some challenges and constraints. Um, there is a general lack of engagement around cholera, and I'm not speaking to the, the audience here. Outside this room, you guys are probably the most committed people to cholera that there are, but there is still a, a lack of, uh, of engagement on, on cholera, fitting between... Is it an emergency? Is it development? Pfft, nobody's really spending the, the giving it the attention or the money that it that it that it needs. So this lack of financial resources, it's squeezing uh, emergency response, but then also the development work, which as uh, as we've already mentioned, that is the thing that's going to get us out of this pickle. It's long term investment in infrastructure. Um, but every time we spend a dollar on you know, um, bucket chlorination, that's a dollar that's not being sent, spent on, on a safe borehole, you know, which will last for years. I mean, so there really is a problem here uh, in terms of uh, us. We, we, we are not effective or efficient in terms of spending dollars on emergency response, much better to spend it on prevention. And the comment, I think, on preparedness uh, that came from a colleague from ACF earlier, we would love to be able to do that. Our problem at the moment is that financial squeeze. We have not a penny to spend on preparedness. And we say, 
if you spend it on preparedness, you spend a lot less in response. It's like, yeah, but it might not happen. It's very short sighted, but it is it's it's that that's an indication of how little money there is going around. Um Shortage in um, vaccine, again, Philippe will, will brief on that. Shortage and delays in, uh, in key cholera um, uh, kits, particularly. Um, data, 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 um, really getting, if we could get data that looked more or less the same from all countries. Um, Natalie, Yuri, the EPI team that are, are sweating blood to pull together the, uh, the monthly uh, sit reps, their lives would be a lot easier but we really have such a divergence in, in data. And then we've also got this overstretched international national response capacity. Countries are tired, health, health, healthcare workers are tired, like Somalia, Mozambique. These, they, they need a break. I mean, it's four or five years the, the health workers have been absolutely up against it. COVID, cholera, all the other things that are there. So, you know, there is a, a, a real requirement for uh for um national health systems to have a break uh, but that's not going to happen uh, because we the, the way we see it at the moment this situation is not improving uh, it's it's going to get worse over the next few years um and we're probably not going to be resourced to, to deal with it so on that happy note um oh that's a shame that was a nice slide that one there we go um so on that happy note we are in it together um, GTFCC uh, members uh, with the, the various agencies and NGOs and most importantly with the ministries uh, and the health workers on the, on the ground and we'll do what we can as long as we can so I think I will leave it there and uh, hand back to the chair <laughs>